So what should you do until you get approved? Because that seems to be a big thing. Um, well, ideally, you should be prepping. Um, you should be prepping everything. You know, a really good buddy of mine asked me, and this is just like, you know, whatever the number is, however much money you need to, you know, get your dream started. Um, he asked me, what would I do with it if I had it, like, right now? Or tomorrow like what's the first step you would take and I thought about it because you know I it's not something that I've thought about previously but it's something I realized I've never thought about and I should have thought about um, and it kind of took me off guard because as somebody that likes to be prepared I wasn't that prepared I wasn't prepared enough to answer the question I'm still not prepared enough now so if you can figure out you know create a production calendar um, you don't imagine like what do you do day one well if you get your license then you know what should you do should you you know spend money up front on clones you know to reserve them um, should you you know locate you know where they are or the person you're buying them from are you going to buy seeds are you going to buy teenage plants you know are you going to buy some six footers um, are you going to buy somebody else's moms and start your own thing um, do you have tissue culture lined up? Um, you know, what are you doing day one? Um, and even for that matter, so like my specific instance, I'm looking at being, <clears throat> so I'm supposed to be licensed between now and September, which now being July, that leaves me like zero time for a crop. And that's kind of one of the things is, you know, all right, do I try to play the flower game, even though first off, it'll be the first time producing a crop on that specific terrace with whatever the fuck we're growing and in that soil that I know for a fact is not ready for what we want to do with it. Um, is it worth risking, you know, a mid-grade crop on that? Or is it worth doing something like um, a seed run, where in order to try to you know generate revenue, do we make some F1 crosses, you know, and just sell them as that untested F1 crosses, um, you know, and try and create some sort of revenue for the next season? Because you know when it comes to outdoor cannabis. Once it hits, you know, January, February, you got to understand, like, there's indoor crops that are being harvested in January, February, March, April. And so when people start looking at dates and things like that, I mean, and outdoor is still outdoor. I mean, it's great weed, but it's still outdoor to the consumer in the sense of it still looks like outdoor. Um, smell is never really a factor. I mean, it shouldn't be at least. Um, you know, if you got dank, it smells like dank. But if it's outdoor, it looks like outdoor. If it's indoor, it looks like indoor, ideally greenhouse. You know, if it's some fire light depth or greenhouse, you might be able to, and actually some really fresh outdoor can, you can trick some people. But um, anyways, you know, trying to crop out, you know, for your first crop when you haven't even built a brand yet or have any reputation as a farm and trying to compete during the flood with people that have the volume and the budget to you know bottom the market out and still survive um, trying to play that game is not a smart move so that's kind of what you have to think about um, there's other markets to play though and that's kind of what you have to think is there's not just the flower market and I think that's what we started talking about originally in the uh, you know step zero or the idea was you know what market are you going to compete in um, you don't have to compete for the top shelf. You can compete for pre-rolls. Um, and that's something that's totally doable. You just have to be growing the right strains. Um, you can compete for extracts, but remember that everybody's making extracts. So if you're going to grow a quote unquote oil field, which is, you know, um, that's what they're calling it, but it's basically just a, a crop specifically to be turned into oil. Um, you're growing for different reasons and you have to realize that. You know, you're not growing, if you're just growing for like distillate or something where terpenes are going to be reintroduced, then you're more growing for, you know, THC and like 
hash production and such. I mean, like you're trying to get super oily, you know, highly resinous stuff. Um, you know, you don't need to be growing really terpy shit. Um, you don't need to be growing low yielding shit. You know, if you're trying to fucking just grow oil, I mean, you're just trying to just do it. And even more so, if it's going to be blasted in the oil anyways, I mean, you don't need to spend money on trimming it. You know, you can go quantity over quality. Um, and that's what a lot of people are doing. Because oils that, or distillate, or whatever the fuck you're making, I mean, that can be turned into so many different products. And that's where I think right now, one of the bigger issues is farms not realizing that there are other markets that they can compete in or even farms realizing not realizing that uh, there's other markets that have yet to be created um, I think that's just a factor of people doing things the same way for so long competing against people that have had to change so much to get to where they are um, I think that's one of the, the few ways that um, people will be able to be successful in this industry is if they can adapt and start realizing that selling and selling cannabis and growing cannabis the way that it's been done is that's not the way it, it's going to be done anymore. Um, there are different factors at play now and the time for greed is over to the point where like pot farmers have always been greedy to some extent it doesn't matter what anybody says when you're growing something for fucking fifty dollars or a hundred bucks a pound and that's what it costs them to grow it and turning around and selling it you know for thousands and thousands because you can i mean uh, you know there's a difference between supporting family and and getting rich and all that shit um and that's just facts uh, i mean I'm just trying not to have emotions about it because I've been in that same place also where, you know, um, like money is always an issue. I mean, it, you always want to do better for yourself and for everybody else around you. And so profit is definitely something you're thinking about. Uh, but at the same time, right now, because it's – and a lot of it has also been because those people are risking their lives and uh, going to fucking jail and all that shit and um, taking chances. So that's where all that money comes in. And so, but anyways, just, you know, I had to say that because it's not all about greed. I, I had to back up. Um, however, right now, it's become more about um, people being able to afford cannabis so that they can smoke the way that they know they would rather smoke or that they would smoke if they had access to it. And that's where I think some of the issues are coming into play where pot growers and dealers I mean you know we've had access to this shit forever you know be able to smoke as much as you want you know fuck you know you get you get by off overages you know if you don't know what an overage is is uh, basically how much extra weed is in the pound you know if like that was all you you know or your samples you know some people got by off samples um, just fucking made a living smoking samples all day and that's just it um people got to smoke and that's how most people started selling weed they wanted to smoke for free because that shit's expensive that's how everybody starts let's be fucking real everybody starts fucking selling weed because they want to start smoking for free and that's how you get in the game well right now it's so fucking plentiful that everybody they can't smoke for free yet but everybody can smoke for a lot less um like a lot 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 less and people are having to change the way they live specifically a lot of west coast growers because life is changing and people that didn't have opportunity or a chance now do um you know i would have loved to move out there and start growing fucking pot illegally and all that shit you know when i was 21 22 23 like i would have loved to i wasn't born there i didn't have that opportunity then when the opportunity came, because I created it, I fucking did it. You know, but you know, fuck, like that's 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 what happened. Um, so remember when you're going through this that you're not doing this for yourself. 
You are doing this for your customers. You are selling an experience. And the experience starts at the point of sale. It starts at, do I feel a value for purchasing this? Do I feel ripped off? Do I feel I made a good buy? Then it extends beyond that into the actual experience of using your product. And ideally the environment and hopefully all of that meshes with their personality and whatnot. And, um, then it works out. But you're creating experiences for people. And right now in this day and age, um, especially with people just not making any like any more money and there not being a lot of upward mobility and jobs and things becoming more expensive and to technology uh, becoming an issue for some people in some industries, you've got to remember people have to make choices between spending their money on living and spending their money on weed. As in, you have to rem remind yourself that people decide not to eat out or to buy you know this or that so they can buy some weed that's literally the 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 what happens for some people some people just can't afford it and you know like i've been there before i've had to borrow 20 bucks from my mom many a times i've been flat broke many a times um no shame in that shit but it doesn't change their desire to smoke or uh, the improvement that can be made on them because of your products. And if you can't give your products away to the people that need it at a decent price, like what the fuck are you doing this for? If you're doing it for money, that's that's gone. Like you either have to be super fucking evil now or incredibly genius to make money in this industry now. Um, just because there's a lot of shit going on and you actually have to provide value and improve people's lives. Um, so, yeah. Step 12. Huh. This is it. Um, yeah. Well, I guess the last thing that I'll say is, um, my process has taken a lot longer than I thought. And again, it being June, or July, sorry, and it potentially still not happening till September, um, I went ahead and I filed with the Oregon Department of Agriculture to get a hemp license going. Because time is money, you gotta put something in the ground in farming. And you can't just not grow something. So the hemp license is much, much, much easier to attain than your OLCC. Much easier. Way fucking easier. Doesn't need anything close to the requirements. Um, plus, you still have access to the same species, you're still getting experience. Um, I highly recommend getting a hemp license if you can just because it allows you to access a brand new market or another market that you wouldn't have access to um, it gives you a non-competing product um, or even a complementary product to sell um, plus there's also licenses where you well, for instance like here in Oregon if you have a hemp license or in order to sell hemp goods in dispensaries, you have to have a hemp license and an OLCC license. So that also allows me both. Um, and essentially, when I stop into a store, it basically gives me one more, or uh, like a 50% chance higher, 50% chance um, increase on uh, attaining some sort of sale because I have another good to offer them instead of just my recreational cannabis or just the seeds that I'm creating. Um, I now have hemp or hemp goods um, and even then it still puts me in a position where I can have conversations about that and a lot of it is just having the conversation and you know, not to have a pun but you know to plant a seed and to just allow people to start thinking about stuff where if you're the one making the click in somebody's head about this or that that click will be remembered and you can then, when the opportunity is right and you're prepared, you can put all this shit together and actually create some real value for people. Um, that's what I've done. So with that, this is 
the end of step 12 on how to start a cannabis farm. Thank you for listening. I know this has been a long one. Um, I freestyled this whole thing, but I hope it's of some value to you. And if I can help out at all, um, I'd love to. You know, I don't I don't need to make money off of anything. I just like to see people succeed. Um, you know, it, it sucks seeing everybody miserable. So if, I'm, if I can make a few people less miserable, then you know, I guess I'm doing my job. The only thing that I ask of you is if you're listening to this, to uh, please do the same. Um, try to make a difference in people's lives. Give information away for free. Um, and provide value. Don't just make money. You know, help push this world forward. We fucking need it. Well, it's the end of step 12 of how to start a cannabis farm. Thanks for listening.